All right, let's, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and this conversation. Help us understand more deeply and more fully the created universe. Why you made all things and have used the created world to still understand it. Make us more truly your sons and daughters. And help us be close to you day by day. We entrust this time and this conversation to you through our mother as we sing. Hail Mary, Lord of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among us, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we kind of put this in context of what we're doing. So we started out originally just saying, is there a God at all? And you want to look at kind of what religion is and what religion is true, it's a matter of religion we fall. So the, the Trinity. That's kind of God in himself. Now we're getting into God and related to us. And we're starting with the fact of creation in general. And we'll get to human beings and things like that. But we're starting with this idea of creation in general. What is creation? What's God doing with it? Why does it matter? Why does God make the world all? What is this creation that does with planets? So this, this is kind of very liberal, this is kind of a very broad-based brush with everything except for God himself. And then we'll start focusing in then to uh, creation, the man, the fall, our Lord, go from there. Book of Genesis, Book of Wisdom, talked about creation. What creation is meant to be. You have to look to this point kind of kind of at the ideal, look at creation in the fall, and the fall of creation next week to talk about sin. But here we look at the idea. Look at kind of the goals and the point of it. Genesis chapter 1, and the six days of creation, God did everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. Look at wisdom, chapter 1. God did not make it. Or does he rejoice in the destruction of the living? For he fashioned all things that they might have been. And the creatures of the world are wholesome. And there is no destruction among them, and they made the dead of all the world. For justice and die. It was the wicked who with hands and words by the dead, for they were friend of the time. Made a covenant with it, and they deserved to be in death's possession. Creation can be confusing, even to good people. Because people look world around us and say, well, the world's full of suffering and death, the world's full of this darkness. And even good things can seem to be bad. I mean, good things that the dark would contempt us away from truth. There's also a kind of strange inequality in the world. You know, things are better, things are worse. How come I may have a way where I am smarter than an animal? An animal is different than a, a plant. Why are things unequal? What does that mean? Why is that there? Some people go so far as to say that the physical world is corrupt entirely. Some people, the Manichaeans and Gnostics, would say that the physical world, the flesh, the body, entirely bad, and the physical is bad, and the physical, or the spiritual is good. And these ideas kind of creep into our spiritual lives sometimes. Some people will say, well, get rid of the anything earthly. And then we mean by that that's true. But people think that it means anything visible, anything material. So why did God create a physical world? And is it true that I have to avoid a physical world of material things entirely to become holy and hold up? Does creation matter for the creation? And some people will say, well, look at the world. Well, it seems like my prayer life is right over here in the church. And there's day life. What does this matter? Because it seems like in order to serve God, I have to leave behind my family. I have to leave behind my, my chores and my work. Or doing work and my chores or my family life, it can feel like I have to leave behind God. But if you have to make this choice, what does real life have to do with my prayer life? My relationship with spiritual life, my relationship with God. How does this creation actually show us 
This is a command. Hopefully, you will oh, want to. Let's try this. Check it out. With the coming of Jesus Christ, God become flesh while taking on human flesh and living among us for three years, we can see the universe for anything like Because God, with the very fact who became man, is saying that this world is good. If it was evil, God could not become man. That who became man lived with us and, and was a carpenter and worked and slept and ate and friends and family. This is, these are good things. Like the very good, that's a chapter one. Even pleasure is, is a good thing. Look at that in, in later on in more detail. But it's wounded. How is wounded? Why is it wounded? Me to me look at next lesson. The easiest things. We're going to look at today that the reason why God made the universe. How does the world, world show us who God is? And finally, how is it going? This would be a friend of the world. To start back with this idea, look at very briefly before, but to begin this question is did God have to create? Some people, the Greek philosophers, for example, think of creation simply as like this. Uses the wrong term, but almost like God does force of the very fact is God. But like creation almost emanates from automatic. Like trying to light bulb, light emanates from the light bulb, and that's what makes it light bulb. Some people philosophers say you create a world like it's emanating from God. This light that bursts from God. Not a choice, not a little thing, just kind of just there. Other people kind of think of it like the Greeks, the Romans would say, well, those. Um, God creates his glory because he was hungry, because he wanted us to worship him, or because he wanted power over us. This is one of the ideas that we're floating around the ancient world. If there's a God who creates, we guess to create the same way that we, we create. We make things because we're hungry, we need things. But the God of the universe, looked at before we're talking about God, needs nothing. That is all my own powerful, and therefore we can't give him anything he doesn't already have. Because he's the, he's the creator, the source of all creation, every good thing in the universe comes from him. It comes from him free. He already has it. But this shows us that is God creates freedom. And the fact that God is Trinity means God is not lonely. It wasn't like that God needed us because he was lonely by someone to love. It's like no, like these people do have a pet, some people were lonely sometimes. It's not like God made us. Nothing to do with that. It was lonely, it's need us, and give them anything. God creates freely out of world. And the point of this is really, this is very important point for us to think about and meditate in our hearts. God creates out of love. Freely. The sole reason why God creates anything is simply to lavish his love upon him. To show he can put himself to him. To show him who he is to bring it to himself. God creates simply to share his goodness. And before God created anything, even the word before and after is a false word, because before and after implies time, and time is always created. But we just have to use those words because that's what we think. Before God created anything, all that existed was God. Since God needs nothing, God is, is giving each created thing a different way of sharing from being shares of goodness. Every created thing that exists in some way shares God's goodness in different ways. The mountain shares God's goodness in different ways than the ocean. Different way than the fish, different way than the mosquito. Some of these aren't are, are, are hard to see around the good, at least they exist. Different way than you. Sharing as good. All things have a reason they exist according to their existence in God Himself. That's why they exist. That's why they're here. Everything from ice cream to our friends is only good because God made them good 
gave himself to them that way. There's a priest named Father Smith, um, a very dear man. Father George Smith owns a book on how to teach him in the 1950s. It was this one. He says, Know the good of love. Right? If I know something that's good, I'm going to want it. I say, you know, ice cream goes out as a bomb. I know that person's good, so I know that I'll be friends with them. Know the good is to love. But not in God. In God's different. In God, to will to love is not a desire. To be lacking, that's good. We want something, we see something we want, it's been probably lacking. In him is only joy in the life, by himself. He's so really happy in, in, in the contemplation of our goodness. Right? In the Trinity, he's, he's caught with himself and is perfectly, entirely happy. Creatures have their being, creatures have their goodness, have their beauty. But have it from him who is being, who is goodness, who is beauty. It's not because they exist, that they are, that God loves them. It's not because they are good that God loves them. God loves them in his knowledge of grace. God loves them in his love for them bestowed into some reflection of his if they believe it. That's creation. Is God loving us into existence? And that is a really important thing to recognize. You weren't created because you were useful. Hopefully you are too though. That's not why you're made. You're made simply because you look cute. You're loved into existence. In the beginning of who you are, the center of what you are, what you mean, is love. So the universe that itself shows us who God is. If all goodness comes from God, everything that exists reflects God's goodness in some particular way, the universe will show us what it is. Even when we make good things, all we're doing is taking something already good and putting it together in new ways. The reason why we can make cherry pie, the family of the book, is what's not going to happen. Who knows? You have to take ingredients that are already good and use them in other ways. The reason why we can make good, tasty pies and cherries and sugar and butter and flour and eggs is because those things are already good themselves. You can't take mud and dirt and grass put together and it's going to be a good, tasty thing. <laughs> You have to take things that are already good and put them together. And when they put them together, it's because God made them good, made them in such a way that together they can become something good also. So our surprise does, I don't know if you go loud. Should I thought of that? That's, that's, that's great. God already planned cherry pies. <laughs> God already planned all those things we make. He already knows them. He made them such a way that we can discover them and be there. See, we discover when a portions of the world better or beautiful through art or music or medicine or discovery or the create things. God is not surprised. God makes him this way. And he wants us to look at this more deeply in the next platform of human beings. He wants us to work with him in creation as his tool. He wants us to have a share and part in this life. All good thing and every good for gifts from above, it's the same things. From the down from heaven, the Father of lights. Without with, with, with whom there's all creation or shadow of God, no change. All goodness is from God, all goodness is padded off of God. It's not just that it's from Him. Right? I can give you things, not a lot like me. You know, here's, here's the marker, here's a phone, here, it's not like me, it's not padded off. But God is the creator, the source of all goodness. Every good thing is a pattern off of God. If you look at this very briefly last, last time, we talked about the divine word. And so the divine word is the pattern of which the, the Father speaks and creates the universe. So all goodness. God is the pattern of every thing. 
It's really wonderful to think about that. But every good thing comes from God's own goodness. Every good thing is good that is like God in some way. I know it's a blueprint. It's like when we make something with a blueprint or idea, what does God have before anything exists? Himself. And so all good is a pattern off of images, reflects, is an echo of the creator. Now, be careful. I'm not, I'm not saying creatures are parts of God, I'm not, I'm not the pantheism. I'm not saying that, that the world is God. But they're receiving something real. And they're receiving it in a, in a unique way. If I give you, if I had one of these pen papers and give one around, I was like, I have less. My physical things, we give, we take, there's about the same amount we have. Spiritually, they're different. If I give you information, I take you an idea. You really get something. You get to this little meal you have now inside of it. But I haven't lost it. I don't have less of it at that top. God being spiritual, <laughs> what he gives, he creates, he's not losing bits of himself. But we are getting something real. Yeah. He's sharing it, he's giving it, there's something real that's being given. <laughs> And when we learn something new, we get new knowledge, we get, get we, we become different. We kind of become a certain way like teacher. Sorry guys, come like me today. Aren't you excited about that? When we receive a share of God's goodness, we become like him. But the wisdom of chapter 13 says this. All men of their nature are foolish and not learning the rest of God. From the good things seen did not succeed in knowing him with. Remember, I am when. That's me. From studying the works of the sir the artist. But fire or the wind or the swift air, the scars or mighty water. They considered gods. But instead of the joy of their beauty, they thought them gods. Let them know how far more excellence the Lord leaves. The original source of beauty passion. Or if they were struck with their mind and their energy, that from these things realize that much more powerful than see you later. From the greatness and the beauty of the created thing, the original author by analogy is seen. But for these, the blame is perhaps the last claim and deed gone astray, they see God as divine. They are distracted by his work because they're his works are bad. All things are made to glorify God. To glorify some things to show how good it is, or great. Right? You get excited about a new book you read or you know, like your favorite band. Say, everyone, you know, read this, it's incredible. This is good to this. You're glorifying. You're showing how great it is, you're making people see how good it is. All things shine with goodness. All things are patterned with God. That means they're doing this by their resistance, they're showing God. They're glorifying God by showing in a certain way God's own goodness. The universe, the reason why the look of the world would be in awe is to be struck by its beauty because the world the world that they reflection, an echo of the goodness and greatness of the Creator. The world by itself is showing us God's goodness. He says a different way. Now, so things are good by God's, but not in the same way that God's. This is also important to recognize. It may seem kind of silly and trivial, but you're confused about this. When I create something, it is like me, but not like me in every single way. When I draw a picture, there's something of me in it, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's not, this, it's not the same as me. There's also a lot that's very different. Look at this very briefly, but it's important to recognize. 
So God is different in creation because we owe everything to God. God, we owe God everything from our water, air, food, knowledge. But God owes nothing to everything anybody. God is the source, God is the giver, be the recipients. There's a real difference between being good because someone made us good, between the source of all good that means that means love. God is infinitely good. We are creatures from God. God is uncreated, and everything else is created. Nothing else exists without God. All this has to begin because God made it. Be exactly like God would mean that it would be unexist but uncreated. God is infinite. He has no limitations. Well, we have no limits. We're limited by their natures, by the creation, the fact that God is say existence. Nothing can be as good as God because everything else, nothing else is unlimited. Everything else around us we see in this, it's physical, it's here. They have weight, they have space, our sense, have parts. God, of course, is not. So the things that reflect God do so in their limited, imperfect, created, on some material ways. They show who he is never perfectly and completely. If I take a mirror, and I capture the sun of the mirror and reflect it, it can still burn your eyes out. Don't do that. There's still something in the sun of the mirror. The image is there, the sun of the heat's there, but not, it's not the same thing as in the sun. I can't, I can hold the mirror in my hand, I can't hold the sun in my hand. There's something to do this, but it's not the same thing. This is why the Christ says no one is good but God alone. It's all that is good like that for God alone. What this means then is looking at the world, we understand who God is. The universe glorifies God, it's patterned off of Him, it shows who He is, we understand who God is by looking at the world. Think of your favorite musician, your favorite music, your favorite artist. If they were to discover a new song by a favorite musician, you start recognizing them. Oh, yeah, that's great. A new song about that. Hear on the radio the first time, well, that's great. I know that. Because every musician has something of themselves in their songs. The way they play, the way they sing, the way they work music out. People who study paintings can look at art and, and notice for the brush strokes. That's authentic Renoir, authentic Monet, authentic. Raphael, look at those and say, say these, these things are real because we do know by the they paint, the, the composition, like the kind of paint they use, the way they use the brush strokes. But something of themselves. You know, it takes practice, right? If you don't know, heard a person before, you're not going to recognize who you are as you hear the music. You have to know that first. You have to study the painting and you know, know what these things are. It's, it's not, so these things take practice and study, but once you study and practice, it becomes more moral. And the same thing is true with creation. The artist has put himself into his, his creation. And the created world then speaks to us and shows us who it is. Now it takes a little practice, it takes a little study, it takes a little bit of effort. Once you see it and recognize it, it's different. All around you are the fingerprints and the glory of God, the messages of God. A beautiful mountain. You go to the mountainside, you go to the woods, you see a mountain up there, and you're all there. There's something that a mountain that makes it, like everyone kind of stop in the wild. It's kind of tall, it's kind of this, take it in. There's just this, this awe and majesty. That little lump of, 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 of rock and earth and trees and majestic is not majestic. It reflects God, it glorifies God, it reflects the majesty of God as best as a lump of earth and rock and grass. Do you them? Why did God make some things better than others? There is in the creation, in this whole What's what the philosophers call the analogy of being, a ladder of existence. Look at the created world.
God is uncreated, pure spirit, intelligent, a person. Who are angels who are created, limited, a pure spirits, persons. If human beings who are created, finite, material, still persons, if you think you will. And animals who are created, finite, limited, long persons, but still have that emotion you can think about in a certain not what we can. Your plants, created finite, they can't really think and emotions anymore, they can't sense anymore, they have rocks, so they just kind of exist. So, like that, they exist, they're created, but there's this hierarchy. And in fact, what they'll say is that it's not just simply these things exist, these things exist in different ways. Life of God is different than life of man, different than life of man, different than life of man. Because life itself is a different kind of life. So there's what we call the analogy, because these things look similar, this looks similar, but the very life, the very being, the very existence is a different kind. Also called the ladder of existence. You will see in various theology or philosophy texts kind of this ladder drawn of God and down to critical life. Why did God make this hierarchy? Why not make everything equal? America's weapons be equal. Why is that be equal? Why isn't this why isn't that fair? It's actually very, very good for God. To understand what God's doing with this hierarchy, there's the two very important facts from mind. First of all, all things reflect on those are like God in some way. And secondly, nothing reflects God perfect. Right? Because not everything else is great, everything else is limited in some way. The first reason why there is a hierarchy is many things together reflect God more perfectly than one thing by itself. Because no creature can perfectly capture his goodness. And God, being perfectly good and perfectly happy, wants to share his goodness as best as he can. God makes a variety of things, shares goodness in different ways. But even you as individuals have a unique share of God's goodness, no one else has. A unique, a unique spark, a unique place in God's plan, a unique touch of God's hand that makes you different and unique and good like nobody else. Every great thing in the, in the world has some unique sparks, some unique thing that makes it different and good than anything else. God makes unique creatures that are different. So the lion throws God's power in a different way than the bull does. The sunrise, the waterfall, and the stars glorify God in all different ways. And together, they reflect and glorify God more fully than they could about themselves. I think a piece of the music, a single note can't capture the idea of a person, of the artist, the way a symphony can, or a full song. A greater world is a harmony reflecting glorifying God in the music. The song which was better than who God is. See, the fact that there's a higher order, the fact that we're not on top of it, you're not in the middle of it. Look at the line The fact that the hierarchy acts the right gift to us. If everything was the same, it'd be hard for us, it's harder for us to see that there was one above all. If everything else was exactly the same, it's harder for us to see that there's one above. The fact that there's this, this hierarchy, you can see this very clearly, the old well, okay, well, there's, that can reach up upward, what's at the top? And so this helps us to understand God better and pulls us to knowing God. There's another great thing. See, by the very fact that there are lesser creatures, that we have needs that God does not we have different talents and gifts, we can help God by sharing this relationship. 
If they're all equal and the same, what can we give each other? The fact that we're different, the fact that we have different talents, different, different, different goals and place in God's plan, means we can help each other. We can unite each other, we have covenants, friendships, all these things we can give to each other in whole new ways. See, the best, the hottest fire doesn't simply make something hot. It'll make it so hot it makes its own fire. The best teacher will only be able to teach you something, the Lord's so about to teach you somebody else. God is so good, only well, does He make us good, He can make up the other things good as well. The fact that we can make cherry pie is proof of God's goodness for us. Because God letting that you and me have a share in making the world better. A share in, in His own work, a share in doing things like He does. And so God's made this hierarchy and left this hierarchy here to be share in what he does, become his children, and work with him, and walk with him, and do these things with him. So for example, a plain lump of marble does not show that God is good as a statue of Jesus. The marble isn't by itself going to become a statue of Jesus. An artist come along and carve it and do work on it. Once it's done, now, now that of marble glorifies God and shows that perfectly the God of God's own. We need God's we need other people to think, to grow, to be exist in the first place. We're born with the work of our parents. Come to know God with other people. Right like the apostles and the priests are teaching. God lets creatures share his work. God lets us walk with him and help him in his creation. And, and in my opinion, this is my opinion, so the last one's on there. In my opinion, this is specifically fundamental to what needs to be a human being. And for me, it comes up over and over and over again the reason why he does things like he does, why he makes it for church, why he makes sacraments, why he makes. I look at this in more detail as we go along here, but to me, it's very fundamental. Being a human being who wants us to be like him and to share his work of creation. Question on this so far? Okay. One aspect of the hierarchy is souls. This is a confusing question because it's one of those words that changes meaning over time. It takes it fun. So, soul. Simply means a life principle of a thing. What makes something alive? See, so obviously, rocks are alive. That was computer. But some of these things, most of these things are. There's there's something that look at them and say, here they're alive, here they're not alive. They're dead. There's something that, that makes them alive, this, this life principle. And in fact, when we look at it, we'll see there's different ways of being alive. Life is not one thing, it's a different kind of life. But plants alive, it takes nutrition, it has weight, it has plants. Its life principle lets it do with those things. Without its life principle, the plants that they can't do those things. An animal is alive, it only does what a plant does, it also moves itself towards things that are good for it, or avoids things that are bad for it. It interacts complete, in a more richer, complex way. Again, when a dog dies, or an animal dies, it can't do those things. Like the principle lets it do, a dog that principle lets it do doggy things. You and I are. We can do all those things, plus with intellect and a free will. We can choose things freely. We have a moral life, spiritual life, we can pray. We have an intellect. We can see a reason for things that aren't simply physical, material. We can know things that are abstract, like mathematics. Some of us more than others. 
to abstract things like justice or truth. Most people, when they talk about the soul, they mean a, a spiritual soul. Which is a man's soul, a human soul. But in a certain way, you could say a plant has a soul, you something like personal. I mean, a spiritual soul that's, that's, that's a person that's in the first human beings. What happens to the soul when it picks drives? Well, that depends on the soul we're talking about. The souls of an animal or a plant depend upon the body's existence. You destroy the body, the soul is destroyed as well. It's a light principle, but it's not, but it's a material principle. The material part of it makes it alive, or parts. But the soul of a human being is, is immortal and immaterial. It's not this. And we know this only because God has told us this. But because of the fact of what it can do. See, material things not only affect material things. I can't touch ideas with my hands. If you can, let me know. I can touch your ideas with my ideas. Whisper in your ears, and say, by the way, as you know, no, no. So a, a physical thing can affect spiritual things, material things. But there's a part of me that does know what affect material things. That can grasp and hold and contain things that aren't material. There's a part of me, therefore, that's not rely on my body, depend upon my body, and therefore, when the body fades away and dies, it will last. And so I can know by reason, again, I was taught so told us this, and it's Revelation 12. No by reason that the soul lasts. Most importantly, we can do is we can know the Imam. Intellect and free will. Which lets us be friends of God and have relationships with God. Questions? In well, some ways, I know this, this is very abstract and it seems almost kind of, kind of simple. But this, this is so, so important to recognize and so important to have the foundation. We talk about the creation of man. We talk about what's original sin. We talk about Adam and Eve. You don't, you don't get this. That the fact that Darn of Eve is good, the fact that the world is good, the fact that your life is good will make no sense. So right now, we're just kind of laying foundation We'll build off that in the weeks to come. Yeah, I, I, I'm hoping that none of this is too shocking to any of you. The physical world is good. Because of the fact that we're very easily pulled away from God by things we can see and touch and feel and everything else. People can think, well, this world is evil. The very fact that God made it proves that's not true. That God can't be evil. Remember, we talked about before, evil is not a thing in the way that a table is. Evil is a lack of something. So a hole is, is made in the same way that the cloth is made. A hole is a piece missing. It's not something made in the same way as it's taking something away. Dark is not made in the same way that light is made. Dark is the atmosphere. A lie, which is say evil, is missing something too. What's missing is that correlation, the connection between what's real. That's supposed to. Where evil is, it is a good missing. Something that's supposed to be there is not. Things only exist because God made them. You have to go by God in some way. If someone says God made evil, the saying is God is evil. Which we know is an impossibility. Evil is the opposite of evil. Evil is something to destroy. 
But to call the physical world evil is to say, I have a God to make it, which is nonsense, not the greater. Or it's to say that God himself is evil. Where did evil come from? Evil came from free will and choices. Two creatures, I heard, are meant to help God create the world, chose against God's mind. Said, I'm better than God. And if God is a source of goodness and truth and life, choose against God, he chooses against what? Goodness, truth, and life. And it's supposed to be there, it's evil. We're going to get more detailed original sin next, next time. And that's where it comes from. We have to emphasize that this world was made to help men know God better. We begin to know everything through our senses. The reason why we have a material universe is because that's how we know anything. Even profound things, the fact that we're loved by somebody begins with the senses. Try, try to love your spouse without anything physical. Anything that don't speak, don't use your senses at all, don't talk to them, look at them. Is that going to work very well? Try to get a new idea without using your senses. It's not going to work. Our knowledge, our love, our life begins in our senses. Then we can get into ourselves. So we're able to take God's gifts and use them to know God better, do good, and to help other people. This world is there to help us to be a stepping stone to God and to be like God. I think creation is made the way it is because God says that the real way of leaving the world finished for you, make good, make it bad. Help me with my creation, make things more beautiful, even better, what you do by your choices. The physical world is good because there are these things there that there's no God to walk with him and to work with. Why do good things then rise from God? It's because we can choose pleasure and the good. Things that cause pleasure, friendships, ice cream, uh, being with God in prayer, these things are good. And God has given us a sign that they're good in the pleasure. But they become attractive to us. You want to eat because it gives you joy. You want to pray because it gives you joy. You want to pray because it gives you joy. Pleasure is made by God as a sign. The disciples say, hey, it's good. Attention. Oh, well, okay. It's good. That is good. It's a sign to us. However, because of the fall of Adam and Eve, we can be focused on this rather than this. We look at the sign rather than the actual good thing. Concupiscence is this part of us that God made that makes us a practice toward the good. We all have it. It's all good. Silence. It's the pursuit of good things. You have certain emotions and reactions in our brain and our body that make, that make the pursuit of, of good things easy. Right? First of all, we have emotional desire for people, friendships, for spouses. Right? It's supposed to be not only a, a intellectual knowledge, well, this is a good thing to do, emotional knowledge. From God's plan, we're supposed to all go together. The body will be held by the emotion. That the soul can help with the free will and the intellect, but all work together. You're not supposed to, uh, I might take out the garbage today. Let's do it, it's a good thing. It's emotional, God's planning, it's emotional desire that too. Not anymore. So, and that has to be completed by the grace that God gave us. But we have. We have now the disorder of the human system. For this desire that God has put into us, look for the good, seek the good, to rejoice in the good, has been twisted. And now we want to seek the pleasure more than the good thing itself. So 
who desire for people who are cared for and have things that are taken care of, becomes Greek. Well, there's a good part of us what is meant to be there to help us take care of each other. You know, make sure that you're safe, you're taken care of, becomes Greek. Money, 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 thing to say. Good that I eat becomes desire and pleasure food. No, no. Plus, the, the good, good, good of the spouse and the friendship becomes lust. Of life. The good things that are in the world are twisted and affected by Jesus. So now there's a desire to seek the pleasure or the actual good thing. It's just, for example, the people look at the elderly and they say, they're ready to die. Um, what are the signs someone is close to death? They stop eating. Why do they stop eating? There's no pleasure. No taste of it. No taste of it. It's hard to eat, but they don't taste good. When things taste good, it's easy to eat. When things stop tasting good, it's hard to want to stay alive. But that pleasure is there to sign eating is good for you. But it was twisted by sex. The physical world is made for us. This is a start of the day. Because we're used now to scientific things, people saying, well, we're so small, we're so unimportant, we're so insignificant, we don't matter. That's what God says. Like God made a man die for us. Yes, there's other things bigger than us, more beautiful than us, and... but God loves you the way you die for us. God did not die for the cosmos, God did not die for pain, God did not die for the nebulous, God died for you. And God only God died for God created the universe for you. All of the best panting of the stars and the created things, all that exists is because God wanted to give you something new. He loves you. This becomes the arena that you walk with God and serve God. We decorate the arenas of our sports team at home. Make them cool places, beautiful places. This is the arena in which we serve God, know God, and follow God. God has decorated his arena. Or beautiful we can. We have a special place because God has offered us friendship. He offers it only to two creatures, angels and men. That's not often the rock to friendship. God loves the rock in a different way than loves us. He loves the rock to a distance, but the rock is not God's friend. You love your dog and your cats, your goldfish, they're not your friends. Persons. You need place in creation because we have a body and soul. This is different than the angels. Angels are physical, angels are pure spirits. Because we are body and soul, we are a bridge between the spiritual world and the physical creation. We stand at the same time in physical and material reality. We also have a spiritual part of us, we stand there with the angels of my God. So we are this bridge. And what we're here to do is to take the physical around us and to bring it back to God. We're here to take the, world, the physical world around us, make it better, beautiful, and bring it to God along with Him. And take the knowledge and glory of God and bring it. This is the world. And something that we do as this bridge between God and the spiritual life, the spiritual world, and the physical. When the world is joined to man, and man is joined to God, God is glorified more fully, even in the simpler things of this, of this creation. God is brought more fully into the in a very real way, we're meant to be priests of the physical world, offering the physical world to God and bringing down God of the physical world. God wants us to choose free. He gives us a place to live and live in. He gives us a place to adore and make it beautiful. You walk with God in this life. So, what is it that you do then with your life? 
This life we live in our work, in our families, in our hobbies, in our schoolwork, that's where we serve God. That's where we most importantly bring God into the world. In the world of God. It's not that we serve God only when we're praying. We must do that too. We serve God in daily life. As part of our shared creation, as part of what we're called to do to glorify God and bring these things to God. If we can do that with our rock, we can do it with our families. If we can do that with a paintbrush, we can do that in our workplace. If we can do that with a music listener, we can do that when we look, when we talk to people, when we read people, when we work with people. These things are where we serve God, when we know God, when we love God. There's a there's always their connection. These things are fundamental to recognize and realize what we're called to do, what we're to live, to be Christians, to be a perfume that pervades the entire world with the glory and goodness of God Himself. One more question, this comes to mind off the end of this, is the animals go to heaven. We'll answer this briefly before, before this is an answer. It depends what you mean by go to heaven. If by go to heaven you mean they be saints and they see God face to face, no. If you mean they be in the same place as human beings are, so there's going to be heaven, it's more physical, heaven will be physical because they are material. They be in the same place there, why not? Because that part is not real to us. That part is not always one way or the other. Uh, some people say it makes sense that the Lord will glorify it more fully. People will say no. But at the end, that present will build. It's one of those surprises that have left for us. We can't be at that. So, can you believe that animals are in the same place? Yes. Do you believe animals are saints? No. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> Could God choose to resurrect Fluffy the way he resurrects the body? Yes. Could God choose not to? Yes. As it reveals to us. Questions? Okay. Let's then wrap up with those four dogmas then. Again, okay, connect those things. And again, I know, I know, right now, I mean, these ideas are of the abstract and the simple, but they're so important. They're so foundational to the common mass. So you have those four dogmas, the Trinity. The Incarnation, the Church, and that. Creation is the work of the earth. That's what exists in the work of God. In fact, he wants us to make things that he gives himself, what he gives to. And he planned that some of the created world, human beings and angels, would unite him and all in friendship. The incarnation is the only proof that this world was good. God became man, that we can be human beings. That's what God has your body. And so Christ's unique way then becomes is, is the high Christ. He feels the location of mankind. We fail to truly bring the world to God and repose we sin. Which Christ does that for us. That helps us do it as well. So now in Christ, through Christ, we can fulfill our vocations to bring the world to God. The church comes to us. As the fall. It's a unique way where the material world is most honorable, just especially the sacraments, baptism, Eucharist, confirmation. They're physical things that give us God and spiritual life, is applied to us by the church. This is where and how we unite the Trinity. And as for us, we're the pinnacle of the physical world and the bottom of the spiritual world, of the spiritual. And so, in the unique role in the universe, as, as spiritual persons, we can know God, love God, be with Him forever. And as physical creatures, we can take the work of the world, the world here and work of the physical universe. Therefore, we have a unique role, and you the physical part of creation to the spiritual part of creation. C.S. Lewis is as an amphibian, he begins his life on earth and ends up in heaven. That is creation. 
Good questions. Did you just say amphibian? <laughs> That's the word of sea slopes, yeah. Okay. Same with an amphibian that gets the water into the land. Mm -hmm. You get in the yeah. physical and the yeah. <laughs> manly amphibian, the sea slopes. Alright, close the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and this conversation. Help us understand more deeply the physical world and our role in it. Help us understand how real life, Christ, who is given to and glorifies. And all that we say, I do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. World of thy Amen. The Lord be with you. And mighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace.